Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect Podcast, episode 75. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. Rick and myself are the hosts of the Cardano Effect, and we have a very, very special guest on the program today. I'd like to remind everyone, if you're watching this podcast, if you're listening to this podcast and you like what we do or you don't like what we do, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Please consider helping this channel out. We have a plethora of different content on this channel, whether it be our live streams or our guests. And as we boost our subscriber numbers up, we're, o- we're over 6,000, by the way. As we boost these numbers up, we'll be able to increase our clout and reach out to various different members of different blockchain projects and different spaces within the blockchain community, and we'll have a little bit more leverage to get them on. So if you really enjoy the guest, please consider hitting that subscribe button. I want to get right into the mix of things because we have a lot of questions for our guests today. I'd like to remind everyone that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice. Remember, you are your best financial advisor, and if you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. We're recording this on a Tuesday evening, Eastern Standard Time. So, Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? What's happening? Hey, it's going great, Philippe. Thank you for asking. I would like to give a shout out to the Cardano Foundation for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you very much, Cardano Foundation. We very much appreciate your support. And I would also like to introduce our guest here, Mr. Manmeet Singh, man of many, many hats. He is the chairperson, vice chairperson of the Cardano Foundation and the chief financial officer and chief investment officer at Emergo. So at least three titles there, and maybe even many others that we don't know about. Welcome, man, meet. Thank you for coming on a part, the Cardano Effect today. How are you doing, sir? Very good. Good morning from sunny Singapore. Uh, thank you guys for having me on this. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be on your podcast, and that too, the 75th one. It's got to be a special one, I hope. Yes, yes, very much so, very much so. So we have a lot of questions for you today, man, meet from the community, and we're going to start off with some questions that Rick and I had, and then we're going to jump over to the subreddit. So I see that you've been involved with blockchain since 2012. How did you get involved with the Cardano project? And in those previous years where Cardano wasn't didn't exist. Were you working with any previous projects prior to your role as the vice chairperson of the Cardano Foundation and CFO and CIO of Emergo? Yeah, so um, my entry into uh, the blockchain space actually uh, started uh, while I was living in Shanghai in China. So um, I also work closely with um, China Accelerator, which is the uh, largest, uh, most prominent and successful accelerator um, in Asia, really. Uh, and uh, back then, uh, through China Accelerator, uh, they made several uh, early investments in companies that were leveraging blockchain, especially for cross-border payments. Um, so that was one of my first sort of introductions into the into the technology and you know, young entrepreneurs, uh, super intelligent, super, um, uh, just super industrious entrepreneurs who, who look at the technology and, and find some problems and go, wait a minute, this is, this is fantastic, right? Let's take away friction and, and inefficiencies and, and, and speed related and cost related issues with cross border payments. Uh, and let's put all of this on a, on a, on a blockchain and, and let's uh, use a Bitcoin uh, to facilitate such payments. Um, so as we were delving deeper and deeper into, you know, what is blockchain, and we were learning with these early stage investments, you know, what what really happens in the market, how people react to it, uh, the challenges of actually building out a product like this with this cutting edge technology in a regulated market and ecosystem, and you know what is what are the implications there, and so on. So as we started sort of understanding and learning that a little more, I got even more um, interested in the uh, possibilities that uh, blockchain as a technology, as a core technology layer, uh, brings to a variety of use cases that I could see. Um, so then, you know, from there on, we just got, it's, 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 it's that same rabbit hole that everybody falls into, uh, just got deeper and deeper and deeper. 
uh, then started making some more angel investments in the space. And then in, uh, I think it was, um, I think first quarter of 2017, um, before the summer, a uh, common friend introduced me to uh, Ken, Ken Kadama, who's the founder and CEO of Emergo. Uh, we got it, you know, we just started sort of talking, getting to know each other. Um, he was building Emergo as the commercial and venture arm of Cardano. Uh, that got me uh, into the Cardano ecosystem and learning and understanding about it and reading up uh, the philosophy behind it, reading up about you know, Charles, who I already knew from my previous uh, reading and understanding of uh, the blockchain space. Um, and then as we discussed more and more between Ken and I, and we started sort of collaborating uh, first informally, then more formally and so on, as we built up this sort of uh, understanding and relationship uh, between ourselves, and we saw that there's a lot of synergy between what I was doing and what I, he was looking to do and so on. And then we decided, hey, you know what, we should uh, pull in uh, resources and experience and, and let's build Emergo um, together. So I came on board uh, to support Ken to build Emergo out. Uh, then, of course, as we're building Emergo out and, um, and, and um, executing sort of, you know, a, a strategy that we had in our minds. Uh, that's when we got to the scenario where, uh, with respect to the Cardano Foundation, we needed to um, uh, put in a, a, an interim council uh, to carry out a bunch of um, activities there and, and tasks there. Um, and then within our ecosystem, you know, it was decided that I would uh, be one of the uh, council members, and that brought me into the foundation. So here I am. Okay, thank you for that, man. Me and the next part, the uh, next thing I would like to ask you: you're wearing three different titles, and possibly even more, as chair, vice chairperson of the Cardano Foundation, chief financial officer, and chief investment officer of Emergo. Which one keeps you busy the most, and where do you spend most of your time? They kind of just blend in some ways into into each other in some ways um, I think my uh, two roles uh, within emergo are uh, for all practical purposes fairly seamless uh, yeah you know these are uh, titles and roles that we traditionally have in organizations to uh, distinguish effort, but it, effectively, I am, you know, uh, somewhat of the the finance guy, for lack of a better uh, description, uh, at Emergo. All right, so that obviously uh, fills into uh, a more sort of financial overview, financial controller, CFO, whatever you want to call it, uh, sort of role. Uh, and then, because of my past experience in uh, investment. I have a banking background and several years of uh, investment experience uh, starting in China and so on. So because of that, um, it you know became um, most appropriate, I guess, for me to take over uh, the investment-related activities that we were uh, foreseeing or planning out uh, from Emergo. Um, so those two roles in some, you know, in a way are somewhat uh, integrated and seamless. Uh, the foundation role was something that sort of, you know, was something that we had to fill in uh, because of the history of the foundation. We had to come in and fill those roles in quickly, uh, decisively. And we had to then uh, come in and take certain actions to uh, clean up the foundation, take care of some uh, past issues, and uh, refocus, revitalize, re-energize the foundation so that it proceeds and moves forward towards the original uh, objective of the foundation, right? Uh, and so that wasn't something that was, shall we say, an expected or planned role that was, hey, we've got to get this done. Uh, and everybody, you know, uh, rolled up their sleeves and uh, got in to to take that task. Well, I got to be honest. I was very glad to see yourself, Nicolas and Tamara, 
all become part of that uh, building up of the Cardano Foundation. That was a real confidence builder for me. It really was. I was like, okay, Thank we you. know them. I've seen them around. They're doing lots of stuff. They're putting themselves out there. So, yay. <laughs> Good job. <Yeah. laughs> we, Rick and I have been around since the beginning of the Cardano Project, and we know mm -hmm. the trials and tribulations that the foundation had to go through. Mm -hmm. So this whole restructuring, it, it definitely instills confidence in both of us. And I think a lot of the community members out there, too, I think the Cardano Foundation is headed in the right direction. Brilliant. Well, thank you. That's uh, that's extremely reassuring. Uh, thanks for that vote of confidence, and I hope that we continue to uh, maintain that and, uh, in fact, grow it. Uh, the the confidence that the community has and the um, comfort that the community has at the foundation is doing what one is expecting of the Cardano Foundation as sort of you know uh, almost guardians or custodians of the of the project. However, one defines that, of course. Yeah, and you know, last time the last person from the Card from the Cardano Foundation who was on here was uh, Nathan Kaiser, and at the time, yeah. I think there was twenty one people. Are you about twenty one people at the Cardano Foundation? So they have twenty four or more. It's a lot. It's a lot. You don't have to give me a number, but it's like it's growing. Twenty four or more. Twenty four now. Twenty four now. Yeah, twenty four. Not not twenty four more than twenty one. I, I think. Yeah, it's we had within there was the about twenty one, and now maybe there's twenty four people. Yeah, I'm not honestly. I couldn't tell you straight off the top of my head exactly how many we have, but um, I guess yes. If we add, uh, I think if we we add um, a larger network, including the ambassadors and so on, probably I would. Oh, think. but yeah. not the core. Uh, I think the core team is relatively smaller yet. We're still we're still a small, um, uh, tightly structured uh, organization um, that you know. I think we're we we will be getting to the point where we need to expand further, but we've tried to keep it as judicious as possible. Right. Okay. Okay. Cool, thanks. Delete. So let's let's switch over to Emergo. I have a question regarding Emergo. On the Emergo website, if you go to the news and events, I've been following it. Uh, one of the core tenets or the thematic ideas behind Emergo, Emergo has a statement that says, Emergo drives the adoption of Cardano and adds value to ADA holders by building, investing in, and advising projects or organizations that adopt Cardano's decentralized blockchain ecosystem. So one of the events that recently happened was the Blockchain for Europe Summit in Brussels, where they were talking about AI, IoT, and blockchain, and maybe how those interact with each other. Um, so you see these summits, you see these conferences a lot in crypto. I mean, they happen all the time. What exactly is Emergo's goal? What is the Cardano's project's goal? What do these summits accomplish? Is it is it a place to sell tickets? Because I know these conferences, they cost a lot for individual people. Is it a place to network? Or is it a place where like legislation is getting done and things are moving forward? What kind of events? Because as a third party person or an investor from the community, you're, you don't have that access to what's happening at these summits or at these conferences. Can you explain a little bit more about what's going on? Sure. Hey, thanks for that. I mean, that's that's a that's a really good uh, question, and I'm happy to answer it. Um, so, the question is more about these these summits in specific, like what we did in the European Parliament right now, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we were uh, one of the founding members of Blockchain for Europe, which is a Brussels-based uh, association. Uh, that works very closely with the European Parliament and the objective of the association and the objective uh, of our uh, involvement in it uh, was to work with other like-minded uh, entities in the blockchain space, be they protocols or advisory firms or legislators, regulators or um, uh, research institutions, whatever have you. And the entire objective is to use our collective expertise, knowledge, and experience to engage with uh, uh, members of the European Parliament, so be they uh, the various industry groups uh, and governance groups, uh, regulatory groups within the European Parliament, or uh, the, the MEPs who are the members of European Parliament, 
uh, to speak to them about the industry and what we require as a collective. So this is a this is an effort to uh, drive uh, the European narrative as far as regulations and legislations go. See, we all here, yeah, all of I, I'm, I, I know all three of us at the very least, uh, and the vast majority of your listeners, uh, and then everybody else beyond that in the industry. Uh, I think we believe fundamentally at our core um, the sort of transformational power that blockchain as a technology or, or distributed ledger technologies take it one level higher that DLT has uh, to improve people's lives, right? It's, it's not a um, sort of, you know, omnipotent technology that will solve everything for everybody and will have world peace and the end of world hunger. No, but it does certain things brilliantly well. Uh, and if you use it for that, it'll work great. Um, however, to implement that, to deploy that, one also needs to have several other things fall in line. Very critically for our industry, it's um, the regulatory and the legislative framework surrounding uh, the technology, surrounding uh, corporations and organizations that uh, function within this uh, technology space. Uh, and a lot of the uncertainty uh, that exists around that today, be it in uh, the US or North America, be it in Europe, be it in Asia, be it anywhere in the world, a lot of that uncertainty is actually hindering the innovation that we know exists and is ready to be played out. I'm not even talking about the future innovation that's coming in the pipeline or stuff that you know, brilliant folks globally are thinking up right now. It's just the existing stuff, right? If you just take an industry like financial services, I think it's an undisputable fact, an indisputable fact that that, uh, that blockchain technology can completely disrupt the existing uh, financial services industry on a global scale. But the regulations, because it is a highly regulated industry, we need the regulations to be in place to allow this to happen. And that's what we're trying to, that's where we're trying to push the needle forward. So uh, blockchain for Europe as an association, uh, that's its predominant goal. Now coming to the event, as a matter of fact, this event was held inside the European Parliament, which by and of itself is pretty massive. Uh, you know, just a just a huge sort of boost for visibility and, and also to show the seriousness with which uh, the members of the European Parliament are taking this technology and taking uh, towards understanding what we are trying to convey, right? Our message. Um, and because it also happens inside the uh, European Parliament, it's actually free. Nobody had to pay anything for it. Uh, it's paid out of effectively, uh, you know, a couple of sponsors uh, who generously donated, say, for the lunch or a cocktail afterwards or whatever have you. I don't know the exact details of what the sponsors paid for, but a couple of those kind of things. Uh, and the rest came out of the um, budget of the association that all the members have paid uh, towards the association, right? So yeah. that's that's really how, how it works. I mean, we got to push, we have to push that regulatory needle forward. We can huff and puff and talk all we want about well, blockchain can do this and it can do that and it'll disrupt this and disrupt that. But if we don't have a regulatory uh, framework around it, uh, practical implementation at scale becomes extremely difficult. I'm glad you're doing that. That answers your question. It's probably a little longer than you want. No, that's good. That's good. Okay. So to to summarize here for for some of the viewers, I summarize for myself as – Disrupting is a good thing in a sense that you can make banking and financial transactions bigger, better, faster, stronger. That's what we mean by disrupt, right? And the folks who are at, are at these conferences are the movers and the shakers in politics, which is important because they write the legislation. So you're, those are the kind of folks you're talking to, right? Uh, or yes. people who are that's Correct. What, And they need educated. They need to understand what is it that you need for your – uh, blockchain technology to help solve problems. And those are the kind of folks you're seeing at these conferences. Is that what I'm hearing? 100%. So okay. every one of the panels, if um, 
and I think they were also being uh, live streamed at some point, and there will be um, video of the panels put up uh, online. But you know, all of the panels were actually each one was sponsored and hosted by an MEP, right? That's a member of parliament, right? That's like saying you know a senator or a congressperson uh, is sitting on each one of your panels. That's massive, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. um, we do a similar thing. So we're also uh, at Emergo, we're also uh, on the uh, executive council uh, for the Chamber of Digital Commerce in the U.S. This is a Washington, D.C. Uh, based entity. It's been now, I think uh, this, is a, this is their fifth year. Uh, the biggest and largest uh, sort of, in my view, think tank and lobby group um, for the digital assets industry in the U.S., extremely well connected uh, with um, you know the the legislators and regulators in the U.S. You have Paul Atkins, former SEC chair, uh, on the council. You have uh, Christian Carlo, former CFTC chair, on the council there as well. And and you know the Chamber of Digital Commerce, led by. Uh, Perry Ann Boring, and who's been, and the chairman is Matt Rozak of uh, Block. I mean, these these powerhouses of the blockchain industry uh, are there pushing a similar focus and agenda uh, for the U.S. And we, you know, sit and and work right alongside them uh, to drive the same uh, legislative and regu regulatory efforts. Uh, for the U.S., as we do with blockchain for Europe uh, in uh, in Europe itself. I understand. Have, have you seen? Have you seen? Uh, you've been in blockchain for a very long time. Have you seen the legislators warm up to it? Like they used to be cold and push back, like no, I don't want this new stuff. Have Have you seen them warm up to it and understand it better? How's that gone? A lot better than it was. Uh, Back in you know 2012, 2013, and so on, uh, I can tell you, I can tell you that much. Um, but the early days were rough. They're probably like, sure. get out of here. Yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> you know, it's also a natural instinct, and and let's also be a little, I think, um, fair uh, to everyone. Uh, our industry didn't exactly help itself in this matter. Uh, you know, the way we ran, and I've said this a number of times, so uh, I'm not going to, you know, go in depth into it, but, you know, during the ICO craze, uh, we had a lot of really crappy teams throwing out crappy white papers and taking a whole lot of money from the markets, uh, and, and especially unsophisticated investors that would scare any regulator anywhere in the world. It would scare any rational person anywhere in the world. Forget it folks did. who are entrusted with maintaining, you know, <laughs> stability and safety of investors. I mean, that is their mandate, right? It's their job to, um, you know, react the way they react when you come and say, look, everything you've done thus far, you know what? Crap. Throw it out. We're better. We're just better than everything else, you know? What do you? How would you expect them to react? Like, yeah, hey, sure, come on, no problem. Let's let's throw everything we've done, you know, uh, out the window. Now, there's a there are logical arguments that we can place in front of them. There are ways of going about it, and, and so on. And I think that's where now a lot of effort is being put by 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 organizations and institutions uh, across the board. I mean, you know, it's not just us in our efforts. It's, it's really everybody. I mean, the Cardano Foundation, for instance itself is a member of INATPA, which is another uh, organization doing similar stuff uh, in Europe as well. And, and that's, that, that association is being led by the CF. Uh, we're putting in our own. So, you know, even within the Cardano ecosystem, um, we're all putting in our own individual efforts and sort of spreading our uh, collective impact uh, to achieve kind of results. So if you add now all the other protocols and all the other institutions that are playing in this space, uh, working in this space, uh, you have a stronger push. So that's there, which then allows for better education for the regulators and the legislators. They now understand better. And having said that, 
Understand better does not mean that they fully understand. We still have scenarios where we meet, say, some regulators or you meet some, um, you know, uh, members of, of parliament uh, globally. This isn't specific to the EU or any particular jurisdiction. It's a global phenomenon. And you talk about what you're doing and the narrative immediately jumps back to, oh, uh, you guys are, what, the Bitcoin guys? Oh, that's, you know, that's just a scam. And uh, why do we need Bitcoin in current uh, monetary uh, policy ecosystems, right? And you have to sit back and go, wait a minute, sorry, we're not talking about cryptocurrencies. We're talking about the technology and its impact and, and, and its influence and its capabilities transcend the single use case that we're talking about when it comes to cryptocurrencies, right? Cryptocurrencies are one use case for blockchain. There's so much more that it can do. Uh, and then you have to even teach them about that distinction. There's a technology and there's cryptocurrencies. Um, so we have those discussions as well, right? And that on the other end of the spectrum, you have other uh, highly educated, super smart regulators or legislators who you meet and they start asking you specific, you know, technical details about specific protocols. And you go, whoa, hey, hold on. Uh, let me get my CTO here to help you out because this is even beyond the depth of my uh, knowledge and comprehension. It's, 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 a, it's a wide range, but it's certainly getting better. The needle is moving forward might not be at the pace that the industry wishes to, but it most definitely is moving. Excellent. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're educating those uh, leaders out there. That's great. I, I right. hope more of them have uh, more of an open mind because it seems like they fall on various ends of the spectrum. Some of them are interested and some of them are just completely closed to the idea, which is unfortunate. That's so a good I'm point sure. for you. That's yeah. a good point. Where have you found people more open to these new technologies, the leadership of the countries like the EU, the United States, uh, in Singapore, Japan? Who seems to be more open and who seems to be pushing back a little? It's fair to compare, right? Um, sure, it's fair to compare. Uh, I think if I were to put it on some sort of a um, sorted list, uh, probably the U.S. is the most challenging. <laughs> you have a lot of different regulators out there. Uh, each regulator has their sphere of influence, which sometimes for at least the layman in me seems to overlap. And you have, um, you know, different interpretations of how the regulations are going to be or what they are and who has influence over what and so on and so forth. So it's, it brings some, uh, some lack of clarity, really. Uh, Europe, uh, certain member states in the EU, for instance, are more progressive than others. Uh, places like uh, you know, uh, Malta, for instance, or uh, Germany. You know, Gibraltar, Germany, for the technology, most certainly yes. Uh, Germany towards uh, the cryptocurrency space, actually, you know, fairly, fairly open, but they also have very strong views. Uh, there was actually a really good panel um, in, in, in Brussels the other day during that, that uh, summit uh, where we had um, head of payments and all for the Bundesbank uh, over there. And he had very strong perspective of, you know, why blockchain is or isn't uh, necessary and its impact on monetary policy and monetary systems and so on and the risks thereof, right? So one can debate that, but at least, you know, the good thing is he was there and actively engaged and in and, and dialogue and, and discourse uh, with members of the uh, blockchain space as well. It was one of the best uh, panels that we had there. So Germany has that. Um, I would say that Asia, by and large, is uh, a lot more proactive in this, um, maybe because of the pace, the the customary pace of growth and change and development that we've had in Asia for the last 30 odd years. Um, a lot of it coming from China and Japan and, 
you know, uh, South Korea, who were early markets in terms of interest, understanding and adoption of blockchain, also the larger markets when it came to the ICO craze and the ICO world, right? Uh, Singapore, certainly MAS here, the regulator is very knowledgeable, very advanced in their understanding and openness uh, towards the technology. Um, then you have um, pockets in Southeast Asia, places like Indonesia, places like uh, Vietnam, Thailand, for instance, have uh, very pro-industry regulations, uh, not just uh, for the technology, but also for the trading side of things, um, exchanges and, and regulated exchanges and so on. Uh, India currently is trying to figure out uh, what it wants to do on the technology side. It's it's quite advanced in, in many ways, uh, but very restrictive when it comes to uh, issues related to cryptocurrencies and trading and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, we're waiting for certain uh, guidance coming from the uh, Supreme Court and the government and, and so on and the Reserve Bank, Bendy, et cetera. Uh, China, as we all know, is extremely advanced and progressive in terms of use of the technology and is also probably going to be the first country that would issue a CBDC, right? So you'll have a tokenized uh, renminbi coming out. Um, and that is, I mean, that is just monumental uh, in our industry space today, right? Before anybody else. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're also very restrictive in terms of uh, exchanges and trading uh, within uh, uh within China, within the mainland especially. Uh, so, so you have this sort of you know, dual kind of role. They're trying to be open and progressive uh, insofar as the technology is concerned and adopting it because Asia has been a clear uh, leader, I think, in mass adoption of cutting edge technology that provides disruptive effects, right? Um, having said that, they're also like any regulator anywhere in the world, everyone is cautious about the uh, unhealthy effects uh, that our industry also brings into, into the ecosystem and that which, which the onus is on us as an industry to clean that out, right? Yes, um, yeah. Because and, and, they, and, yeah. They, want, so they want some sort of control to some extent and they don't want people buying illegal products and that's like something that's important. You know, I, I totally I, understand. Very well put, you, very well put, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty amazing. The the work that you have in front of you, um, pretty neat stuff. And you know, what's interesting is in South America, we had Alan Verbner on our on the program on the podcast, one of the earlier podcasts, and that's kind of being driven by the people. So, like the people of in several different countries in South America, they're saying, "Hey, we want to use cryptocurrencies because you inflated our currency two thousand percent last year in my." life savings is now worthless. So let's find some other way going about it. Yeah. And then of course, you know, you have many countries in Africa where we have John O'Connor over there and he's uh, working with them in Ethiopia. And so there's like ripe ground for planting over there. You know, there's, pl there's room to grow. There's room to plant. Seed. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, IHK has done a fabulous job. I think of uh, through the leadership of John O'Connor and, and other members uh, of the IHK team uh, in, in spearheading uh, breakthroughs and opportunities uh, across Africa, right? There's, there's a lot of um, open space there, literally, in terms of uh, bringing the technology and providing just monumental uh, benefits. Um, but, um, you know, these are the sorts of jurisdictions where you will either find more open uh, regimes, be they legislative or regulative, regulatory, uh, and you would find also more uh, open arms uh, from the uh, common man, from the average population, uh, to adopt these technologies because they need it. Right? Mm -hmm. it, it provides certain comfort, certain transparency, certain uh, finality in terms of transactions, uh, immutable records, for who you are, just your own ID, forget everything else. Just, you know, this is who I am and here I prove who I am. This is a question that we're tackling uh, even in India today, for instance, right? Uh, national identity and what that means is uh, there's, there's a whole lot going on uh, in India as well on, on this issue. So 
that's why I think you would find a stronger uh, magnetic effect um, from progressive uh, legislators and regulators, as well as from the general population in these countries uh, towards such uh, genuine decentralized technologies that, that bring back control and power in an open and transparent way to the masses as opposed to centralized institutions where it might be abused. Yep, I see. I you hear see. that, Philippe? We got our work cut out for us over here in the United States. We need yes. to stop them up. Yes, we do. We do. And <laughs> it seems like we're falling behind, too, which is unfortunate because, you know, we can we can really drive that ball forward and uh, set a good example. But yeah. uh, Fortunately, yeah. we have people like Caitlin Long working on it. Yeah. yeah. And we had Jonathan oh, Dunsmore working on yeah. it. So there so, are people working on there it. There are a lot they, of fabulous folks uh, in the U.S. working on this and, you know, moving the needle forward, not just, you know, incrementally, but genuinely, you know, monumentally. Uh, Kate along her efforts in, in Wyoming, um, I mean, just phenomenal, phenomenal. So um, I want to backtrack to something you said earlier, that magnetic force or countries that really need it or you know, maybe it's not as much of an issue in Western countries now because you have other payment rails that you're using and you don't have to deal with hyperinflated currencies. So one of the articles, the news articles that came out on the Emergo website was that Emergo establishes a strategic task force with Uzbekistan government to develop framework for STO, security token offerings and exchanges. Just a little background for the viewers and listeners, Uzbekistan it's not a really populous country. It has around 32 million. Uh, their population is around 32 million, so slightly larger than like Shanghai city. So it's pretty rural in that sense. And um, their GNI is, uh, or their gross national in gross national income per capita is around 2K. So I would 2K USD, two thousand dollars, which I would consider a developing country. So when you when you think or when you hear about Emergo planting their foot in Uzbekistan. Is there a reason why, I mean, it's a developing country. Is there a lot of interest from the Uzbeki people to create STOs or to create exchanges, given that they have lots of different financial troubles to deal with and they're developing their country? Why is it Uzbekistan versus other countries? Why are you putting that stronghold there? Well, it's, it's about starting to uh, bring your ideas and, and thoughts and the opportunities that you see to the jurisdictions where you have uh, the openness and the positive intent of decision makers to try it out, right? Uzbekistan, by and of itself, might not be one of the largest markets uh, on the planet. But if you bring, if you successfully set up and develop a security token exchange out there and you build up an ecosystem where one can trade securities on a regulated exchange transparently and you have clear ownership of those securities, it's only a matter of time with that level of transparency and openness allows for a greater participation uh, by the uh, uh, local population. And two, that brings regional effects, right? So now within uh, the region there, you will have other nations and other you know, citizens of other nations asking their uh, governments, hey, hold on a second. Uh, why do I have this antiquated, uh, centralized, uh, completely opaque uh, financial market ecosystem? However big it is, small, big, it's... That's not the issue right now. The issue right now is concepts and conceptual clarity and bringing, bringing uh, genuine um, examples where we can show the transformative, the trans transformative uh, effect and positive benefits, right? So if you can show that in a place like Uzbekistan, where you have a progressive regime that is open to and encouraging and supporting Supporting such initiatives together uh, with private players like ourselves and others in this partnership, uh, you have a great uh, fertile ground where you are showing a live deployment of the idea, the concept, and what you can achieve, right? 
You do yeah. that there. Now that becomes a case study for the region. It becomes a case study for the world. I mean, who's to say that if we have and we build a successful security token exchange in Uzbekistan, that that would not galvanize and rejuvenate capital markets in that region, not just within Uzbekistan itself, but within the region. And if that opens up, who's to say that tomorrow, uh, you know, global money center, now this is a time, you know, some time away, obviously, but still, who's to say that global money centers have to be limited to uh, the New Yorks, the Tokyos, uh, the Frankfurts, the Londons of the world. Why? Yeah, that's where does true. the vast that's majority where does where does the vast majority of the global population actually live? Right? Yeah. Where is that vast majority of potential uh, spending power? Where is that middle class today? Et cetera, et cetera. It is not in your existing global money centers. It's not. And humanity is not based there. Money is based there, but not humanity. Yeah, right. and, and you know what? You know what the most common argument I hear against cryptocurrencies. If you talk to a normal person, a normal person is somebody who doesn't deal with cryptocurrencies. Is they don't understand the idea of centralized or not centralized. If I if I talk to a colleague about um, decentralized, which I have, and they'll say, "Why is it worth anything? It's not backed by the government." And I say, "Well, that's the point." And I'm sorry, but there's people who are brainwashed into thinking it's not worth money unless the government says it's worth money. And they just don't understand anything outside of that tiny little paradigm. And I'm just being honest. I mean, is it it truthfully? That's a very good point. <laughs> very works, good man. point. Yeah, very good and point. You got your work cut out for you, man. Me. Yeah, I, I mean, walk in your shoes. <laughs> I, I think that was a. I think that was a very good point that you made. I'm a, just about interconnecting the world, and you know, why do we look at traditional banking or traditional finance in these certain hubs that they've always existed in these hubs when there's more than half of the world's population that lives in these underserved, underappreciated areas? They're not part of the global financial system whatsoever. It benefits every single person to have everyone within the same kind of financial ecosystem, a decentralized, I mean, choosing what you want to do, but you as an American being able to maybe transact with an Uzbeki in the same system. And I mean, that's the hyper-connected or interconnected world. Yeah. And if Uzbekistan succeeds, their neighboring their neighbors can say, "Wow, that's interesting. Let's try that out." Right? Just like Manny was saying. Exactly. Sure. Exactly. And anybody else can, right? I mean, it's, it's not it's not the beauty of this is it's not limited. The impact uh, and the appreciation of the impact is not limited to its immediate neighbors. Right. Right. It becomes a a global case study uh, for folks to see and then learn from and then adapt to. Right. Um, I would I would say one thing though, Rick. I mean, you know, I in my heart of hearts, I'm with you 100. percent Decentralize as much as possible, and so on, and so forth. I'm I'm with you in my heart of hearts. The practical consideration is everything is an evolutionary thing. I don't um, fundamentally, at a personal level, believe that we would have you know immediate sort of jumps from centralized heavy institutions to a completely decentralized environment. One has to go through an evolutionary process. That evolutionary process um, pretty much by definition, as far as I can tell right now, um, has to go through working with regulators under existing regulatory regimes, uh, maybe at best tweaking them a bit so that they allow for the innovation to happen and don't just completely shut it off as a knee-jerk reaction to protect uh, whatever they feel needs protecting. Um, and then taking that opportunity, that, 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 you know, that doorway open gave this much uh, a gap and sort of putting your foot in and doing something good and positive. Yep. Not some scam, not throwing, not looking at these open pathways to see how quickly we can do another ICO or another three letter acronym that effectively is a, you know, ICO slash, you know, uh, scam uh, project to fleece uh, unsophisticated uh, investors uh, of hard earned money, right? It's then, it, it then falls upon us as an industry to prove 
and to execute on the promise that we're making, on the vision that we're going around and selling, right? That mm-hmm. execution is critical. And I can't imagine that we'll be able to immediately execute that in a large financial, multi-trillion dollar financial industry immediately. Yeah. But we might be better off executing it in smaller jurisdictions and geographies where one can manage it, right? Handle the complexity and the, and the impact much more, uh, much more closely and then take the next learning curve and the next, learn, next learning curve and improve and improve to the point that becomes ubiquitous uh, globally across different systems. Yep. I understand. I, the change takes 20 years. Major change on a major scale, 20 years. There's no overnight. It doesn't happen. And I've said that a couple of times before, right, Philippe? Yes, you have. Like, you at have. At least 20 have. years. Amen. Like you have. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone or whatever happened back in the day. People didn't have telephones in their houses all the next day. It took decades and decades and decades. And that's fine. That's how it works. Amen. Yeah, and I change every 20 years myself. Uh, you know, what are you going to say? Yeah, yeah, that's how it is, right? Okay. Wow. Thanks for that insight. Yes. It's been wonderful. Phone, I think it's time we got to so, shift to uh, yeah. Reddit. We've got a lot of Reddit questions. All right. I, I should start calling Reddit. I should start calling it the gauntlet because our it, it's got to have a rough name to it because yeah. our Redditors are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we get the Fabulous. best questions in here. Man, meet, and they're tough. They yeah, are tough. That's all right. That's yeah. all right. That's they. They. That's, that's very good. They asked the best questions. <laughs> okay. No holding back. <laughs> Ready? No problem. Let's do it. Go ahead. All right. I'm going to start from the top. Philippe <clears throat> okay. with best. Go for it. Okay. I'm, this is from Brinker59, one of our very frequent flyers on Reddit. Thank you, Mr. Brinker. I appreciate it. And he says, hi, man, me. Thank you for coming to the Cardano Effect. From a community perspective, it is clear the efforts of Sebastian and his team are putting toward building Yeroi and Saiza, which are great products. However... I would like to know what are the bigger goals in terms of adoption, normal users and organizations. I understand you cannot disclose names, but can you give us insights about what have Emergo been working on in terms of closing deals and making partnerships? Man, he, he wants the dirt. He wants the he wants the real stuff. <laughs> As opposed to what has been said so far no yeah. just kidding yeah. <laughs> people always think something's going on behind the scenes that's why i'm saying it with levity so yeah, sure what has yeah. been Virgo been working on in terms of closing deals and making partnerships yeah so i think we also have an extremely active uh social media sort of you know program and effort uh at emergo i mean you know our, our led our marketing and, and communications team led by florian our chief marketing officer has been fabulous in communicating all the stuff that we're doing but um let me let me step back and, and answer that very specifically uh i don't know precisely what sort of uh, partnerships he's talking about but there are different types of partnership different type of initiatives that one can look at when you are sort of focusing on the commercial aspects or building out the the ecosystem for for Cardano. One, uh, we need to have, we need to be in a stage where we have um, a more ready uh, product, uh, i.e. the protocol itself. So we need to go through Shelly and come to Gogan and have that smart contract capability before one can genuinely build solutions on our protocol. We all know it's there. We all know it's coming. We, we understand uh, every, you know, sweat, energy, and effort that IOHK and, and that entire you know, genius team has put into it uh, to bring it to where we are today. So we are now just at the cusp of having that ready. Once we have that ready, now you can genuinely go and talk to corporations and talk to enterprises and say, hey, look, let's look at your business processes. Let's look at the uh, challenges that you have in, in be it in your um, finance function, be it in your supply chain function, be it into, into your manufacturing and production processes, be it in uh, your distribution processes, whatever have you. And here, you know, let's talk about the problems that you have and let us come back to you with 
ways that we could potentially solve it using Cardano as a, you know, uh, really, really powerful, robust, secure protocol layer, right? Uh, we got to get to that. So in the interim, we've been at this for now over two years, right? I've been in Amorigo uh, for over two years now. And, you know, in that interim, you've got to do something until you have a product ready that you can take to market. So what we've done in that interim then, we've looked at what else does the industry need that we can build today or that we can focus on today or in this past two years to get to that point. So uh, at least, you know, three things pop to mind. Number one, anybody who understands enterprise uh, solutions and enterprise space understands that when you do large scale enterprise deployments, it's not just the power of your technology and your solution and all that wonderful goodness uh, and the power of your team. It's also the capability inside the client or the corporation or the entity that's going to use your, 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 your software, your solution. And how deep is their technical bench strength to be able to manage this technology, right? So if you're going to deploy an entire uh, settlement uh, system powered on blockchain for a bank, what you're going to need, you know, dozens, if not hundreds for the largest banks, you're going to actually need hundreds of software engineers, IT uh, folks inside the bank who are going to manage these systems and grow them. You would still be, as an outside organization, you would still be partnered with them. You would still be uh, supporting and driving a lottery. But even within the system, even within the, the your client, bank, or whoever have you, they're going to have to have people in there. Where do those people exist today? If I want to go today and recruit 200 software engineers trained on specific blockchain skills and recruit them for my bank, can somebody tell me where I'm supposed to recruit 200 people today? It's yeah. very, very difficult, and it's extremely expensive. <clears throat> we don't have those volumes out there. So for that, we started Emergo Academy, and we started it in you know, one of two largest markets out there in terms of software talent. We started it in India. We've brought on board the former chief learning officer and the former chief HR officer uh, of one of India's top three largest IT companies to lead that initiative. Right. We're training hundreds of software engineers inside universities uh, in India. We've got you know, a couple of dozen university partnerships. We keep announcing more and more. Um, and this is just for you know, training software engineers at the bachelor's level, right? computer science uh, students at the bachelor's level and, and at the graduate level. Uh, then we also have a program to chain, train existing professionals, IT professionals who want to upskill themselves and move into blockchain. Uh, we have another program uh, for entire organizations, customized blockchain training for their entire tech staff or whatever you know subset of that they wish to train. So you need to fill that, not just for us in the Cardano ecosystem, but for the entire blockchain industry. That's one. The second one is you got to foster innovation. Even if the regulations aren't ready there, there's lots of other usage cases and opportunities that you can support and build and entrepreneurs that you can help. Um, who push that needle forward in terms of showing, showcasing what the technology can achieve. So that is D-Lab, our accelerator in partnership with SOSD, uh, based out of New York. We've done two cohorts already. We're now uh, on to our third cohort and so on. So you know, that's, that's that initiative, right? Uh, then we have our own internal team that's building, uh, and I cannot publicly comment on it now, but there will be some stuff coming out very soon about some enterprise level initiatives that Emergo has built in-house for corporate clients, um, you know, building strong blockchain uh, powered solutions. Uh, and then we also have uh, number four, actually, we have uh, our own sort of advisory and, and consulting team that works with companies or governments. I mean, they, they're the ones that led, for instance, our entire Uzbekistan project where Emergo comes in as a strong advisor and partner to the entire, all the uh, players in that project to execute and deliver on what the uh, government in Uzbekistan wished to, to achieve. And that was led uh, entirely by our um, consulting team, right? 
So these are initiatives that we can do today to uh, grow our influence in the space, to grow our uh, network and to prove what we're preaching in the space um, and take, take that needle for it. That's, that's what we've been focused on. Okay. Yeah, excellent. You know, I'm glad to hear that also about the Training Academy because just like the test net and everywhere else in blockchain, if yeah. you want experts, you have to grow your own. They're, they're, they don't exist out there. Not in blockchain. Yes. It's too young. It's too young. Yes. Next question. Thank you, Brinker59. The next question comes from Darth Prometheus, which is Rick. And this is an inception question because it comes from Pa Corvix. And Pa Corvix asks, does Emergo, has an Af- does Emergo have an Africa strategy? If yes, how and when implementing it? Thanks for your commitment. So one of the uh, beauties of uh, the way the Cardano ecosystem is structured between IOHK, the Cardano Foundation, and Emergo is that we leverage off of each other's strengths and initiatives. So uh, IOHK, as I mentioned earlier, has done a phenomenal job of breaking into the African continent and bringing just you know, a whole host of opportunities and, and relationships and initiatives coming out of Africa. And what we at Emergo are doing is we're going to support uh, IOHK and come in uh, wherever we can uh, add value and we can collaborate. That's what, that's what we're going to do. We don't need, uh, you know, all entities in all places uh, clashing into each other, trying to achieve the same objective that we all share. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pa. Uh, I next question. That, pa. Good. Okay. The next question is from Pra Dip Tonk and says, What's the update with Iron X? What update? I'm not very sure. Uh Iron X is not a not an Emergo thing. Uh Iron X, and we've made that I think uh very, very clear in the past. Um, that was Emergo HK and not, uh, not Emergo us. Okay. So I, I don't have any updates on that. It's not something that, uh, I'm involved with at all. So I I really don't have an answer for it. Okay. Okay. All right. So Philippe and I have to give the answer because that's the requirement. Remember? Yeah. If, if our guests can't answer the question, Philippe and I have to answer it. Heads or tails, Philippe, call it in the air. (laughs) Heads. It's heads. <laughs> you got to answer it. Well, I think Man Meat gave a perfect answer. It was involved with um, Emergo HK, and they're two separate entities. So, you know, there's no update with Iron X. I don't think, you know, um, to, Cardano, to the- Cardano ad answers the question with scam. So you take that as you like. So um, <laughs> make, your own, you make your own educated decision. Um, we'll, we'll jump to the next question. Yeah. Okay. The next question is from Caramel Covered Karma. What happened to Traxia? Um, in terms of um, look, Traxia, uh, as far as I'm aware, is still a, a going concern. They're building their business. They also uh, issued a press release, I think it was sometime last year. Uh, I forget which month it came out. But you know, very clearly, this is an example of what I was saying. Until we have a product, it's very difficult to build upon it. Uh, Traxia has uh, gone on and built on another protocol, and they've made it very clear that as soon as we're ready uh, with Cardano, we have smart contracts, uh, they will evaluate, uh, you know, building and porting over to Cardano. And that's that's the best that we can hope for for any um, entity out there that is looking to build on a blockchain protocol and and where we believe that Cardano would be uh, a leading protocol of choice for them, right? We don't stifle the innovation um, by making folks wait. Uh, we let them build, and then we come out with the superior product, and then uh, naturally they will vote over, right? That's, that's where that is. Okay, perfect answer. Yeah, thank you. That's a tough one. It's the yeah. gauntlet. This is Reddit. Right. Sorry, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for answering question. that, Manmeet. Appreciate it. And thank you, Carmel Covered Karma. And the next one is from Jay Rusa Ada, and he says, Hello, Manmeet. I work for a water district located in Southern California. As we all know, this is a multi billion dollar industry. To be able to track water from well to tap would allow districts to save billions 
<clears throat> Any thoughts on exploring industries such as these with Cardano? The potential is huge. And that's the question. Thank you, Jay Rusa Ada. Uh, water from well to tap. I've never heard of that one before. Have you? Sure. Yes. Uh, look, yeah. happy to. Happy to. We have to understand what the problem is and uh, see how and where we can build a, a strong solution for it. Um, so if they want to reach out to me, uh, please, I would love to hear more about this and, and discuss and see how we could help find some uh, solutions to problems there. Very happy to pursue that, genuinely. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Philippe. Next question, Tony from Shoshone. This is a frequent flyer, also on the Cardano FX subreddit. Banking the unbanked is a common battle cry of many blockchain projects. Having a banking background, could, could your guests expand on how a project such as Cardano will make a difference in people's lives in a continent such as Africa? I'm curious if Emergo intends to support startup accelerators or education programs in Africa. There are many amazing Africans, I'm sure, who will appreciate a helping hand building a better future for their communities. So I think this goes back to the previous Africa question, but if you can maybe add a few. Sure. So, so like I said, we are, we are very, very keenly interested in uh, building the Cardano ecosystem in Africa, finding usage cases and deploying in Africa. As far as we at Emergo are concerned, we are uh, following the efforts trailblazed uh, by IOHK and John Connor, for instance, um, and to because you know they they are the ones on the ground, actively uh, engaging and evaluating all the all the opportunities and all the ecosystem around it. So you know the best that we can do is to um, you know come in alongside them whenever is the right time and bring our capabilities uh, to, to support those initiatives. So um, I, I hope that answers uh, the first part of the question. Uh, for the second part, yeah, no, absolutely. There are lots of great uh, entrepreneurs and um, entrepreneurship opportunities in, in Africa, for sure. Uh, we as an accelerator, uh, you know, we, we launched D-Lab uh, last year. Like I said, we've gone through two cohorts. We're just a year old. Uh, I would like to see us, and, and every, every cohort, we're improving, sort of, you know, refining and improving how we ran the last cohort. What did we do right? What did we not do right? What can, what, what can we improve? Uh, taking feedback from uh, our portfolio companies and so on. So I would like to see a few more iterations of that until we feel confident collectively between SOSV and us that, yeah, we've got a really solid, uh, repeatable, scalable model. And then I would love to take our uh, accelerator uh, business to other geographies. There are tons of uh, invitations we have received from the geographies to expand. But, you know, I think it doesn't make sense to expand until we have uh, quote unquote, a product that we're comfortable with. Okay. All Sounds right. Good. Thank you. I'll go to the next one now. Uh, and thank you for that, Tony from Shoshone. We much appreciate it. The next one comes from Reddit user Predatiptonic. And this person asks When will there be a unified strategy for Cardano from IOHK, Mergo, and the foundation? Now it seems like everyone is working in silos. Now, our Reddit users are, they can be pretty direct. So, <laughs> but it's, that would be a good question. I don't totally know. Fair. I don't necessarily agree. But. No, no, totally fair question. Yeah. Um, I disagree with the premise that we're working in silos. Um, look, you know, uh, Nico and I from Emerico, uh sit on uh, the foundation council. I mean, it's, it's, it's an interim council, but we sit on it right now. Uh, our colleagues from IOHK, uh, both Nathan and Tamara, uh, sit on the council. Uh, so as far as the Cardano Foundation goes, you know, it is a clear um, coordination point between all three entities, right? Uh, what you do not see is the constant and consistent level of engagement between all three teams across various communication channels, be they Slack groups or, um, you know, email or meetups or get togethers that we frequently do when we're working together, tapping opportunities at the same time. I mean, right now, for instance, I was with uh, 
Charles and Tamara and Nathan and Domino and Bakit uh, and Jerry um, in in St. Moritz uh, and in uh, Davos. Uh, and we were, <laughs> we're staying in the same hotel. We're having breakfast, lunch and dinner together every day. We are together, you know, almost the entire day going to different meetings and then bringing each other in, et cetera, et cetera. There's been a lot of effort there too. Uh, you are well aware about our um, the work that we're doing together with uh, McCann in terms of the brand refresh, which is a collaborative effort, as Bakit has already explained on your podcast, uh, to the community between all three entities. Uh, we've also announced uh, that we are working closely with PwC uh, to drive forward, you know, a, a sort of strategic uh, development for all the three entities together. So there is phenomenal amount of coordination effort and on the ground action between members of all three uh, towards a joint uh, shared set of objectives and goals. Okay. All right. You know, and, um, we started this off. Uh, it, it's not siloed where man meat is wearing hats from all different areas as Emergo and the foundation. And then of course you got Tamara from IOHK also in the foundation. So it, it might appear that way to some people. But anyway, thanks for the question, um, Credit Tonic, and thanks, man, me, for the answer. Philippe, you got the next one. Yes, we have a few more questions, three more questions to be exact. Next question is from Brinker59. Hi, man, me. What happened to Emergo HK? This was dealt very differently from what we see in the Cardano governance so far. Nothing was officially said, and many ADA holders were led into investing in IronX project having a massive loss due to their unprofessional approach to business. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we've been we've been very open and transparent as far as Emergo goes. We've made public statements about the, the fact that these are two completely separate entities. We were not involved with the IronX uh, deal from Emergo side. I, I can tell you, you know, for a fact, I... Uh, was I had zero involvement in that entire uh, entire thing, even despite my role uh, at Emergo. Um, so I, I'm, I, you know, sorry to hear uh, what you know, some members of the community uh, ex have experienced and, and feel <clears throat> about it. Um, and you know, there is, I, I really don't know what else. Uh, I can say uh, on on top of that, um, I think I think that has to be addressed um, by um, you know others who were involved with it. Yeah, and I, I understand, and it has been clearly explained before, but the word just doesn't get out to everybody. <clears throat> it was clearly put out that. Emergo and Emergo HK are two separate companies that, you know, that, that's been put out several times. Just not everybody gets that. So Emergo HK may have imploded or whatever happened over there. And it's not Emergo proper. It was something else. So, and, and, I, and you know, they also issued their uh, uh, press releases uh, covering this and so on. And I think there's, there's really not much more than I can genuinely add uh, to the discussion beyond that. Yeah. Okay. No, I totally understand. It's like if I bought an old car that's an AMC and I can't buy car parts for it anymore because the company is no longer there, no one can answer for that. It's really hard. It's hard to do because that company's gone, the people that did that. Whew. Yeah. Well, we we learn things the hard way in the crypto space. We do sometimes. You know, yeah. Both users and investors and leadership. So, Philippe, we'll cover the next one. Yes. So, thank you, Brinker59. The next one is from Eleanor Zia Fay C. What did you personally learn from the recent Europe summit? How is the Uzbekistan partnership going? As a CIO for a blockchain firm, how are your valuation metrics different from a traditional VC? And then the last question was, oh, there's two more questions. How we can do an entire podcast on that one. Let's yeah. narrow it down and then we'll come back to that. We, well, we covered the first two questions already at the beginning of the podcast. We talked about the Uzbeki Uzbekistan partnership and the recent European summit. Um, I guess as the CIO for a blockchain firm, how are your valuation metrics different from a traditional VC? 
And then there's another question. How is the exit strategy for a blockchain-based startup different from other tech-focused startups? For example, OYO. Yeah. Um, look, conceptually, there is no difference. You invest along the same principles. Just as we have a new technology, does not necessarily change the nature of running a business and making a business successful, right? You have a new technology, it brings new opportunities, new processes, new systems, uh, new economic models, new business models. But the fundamental aspect of building a business, uh, scaling it, making it sustainable, making it successful over time, that hasn't fundamentally changed. So the, the core fundamentals of investing in such early stage enterprises uh, hasn't fundamentally changed just because we're using blockchain now and not uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning or VR or AR or cloud computing or big data. Take any technology uh, buzzword, phrase word, acronym uh, that you want. Um, it really doesn't change much. So we're not that different. Uh, when you compare it with a VC versus, um, say, something more early stage, there might be some slight uh, differences because the earlier stage at which you participate in uh, the growth of a company through investments, uh, the greater sort of risk that you're taking, uh, and also you are making your decisions less on proven business models, maybe more on the team, on the technology, on its capability, on its promise, and your ability to help them deliver on that promise, your ability to uh, help them grow, et cetera, versus when you do maybe slightly more later stage VC investment, something like a, you know Series A or something like that, you might be now looking at a company that has uh, possibly some product market fit. It might have some uh, revenue, some traction. It might not be profitable, but it has already something that's driving a business forward. It has, it has clients, effectively it has clients who are paying it something uh, that is of value to them, right? Uh, so uh, in that scenario, you're looking at a slightly more nuanced uh, investment model where you're looking also now at the realities of the business and what it is and how it can scale, et cetera. But not overall, really not that different. Okay. And, and there was know, one more question. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're running out of sorry, time, I but I got to tell you, I'm glad you're on our team. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Your knowledge is really impressive. I've been really yeah. get, enjoying this podcast. It's been great. Okay. Yeah, the last one, much. Philippe. All right, next question is from Dalin133. It says, from a larger perspective, blockchain holds the promise of decentralized finance and thus greater access to markets of all kinds for poor people. But on the flip side, seems to also hold the prospect of greater control of citizens by government via centralized private chains. What is Cardano's stance on this given the Atala project? Okay, so um, I think I'll have to break this question into its two uh, constituent parts. So one, uh, referring to centralized or, you know, permission chains uh, and so on. Look, one can look at it more as an, ev you know, as I mentioned, it's an evolutionary process in terms of reaching at scale adoption of blockchain as a technology that disrupts a variety of industries. And, and you know, it's very difficult, I could imagine, for say, a regulator or a, or a large uh, bank in financial services sector or in healthcare or anywhere where you have, uh, you know, e economy-wide impact if there are uh, um, issues with the integrity of the data and the databases and so on, to then say, hey, let's put everything on a decentralized ledger system um, and then worry about the security of that system, Right. Uh, we have very strong uh, security uh, infrastructure uh, and theory built into Cardano, which would uh, certainly help. But until then, a lot of the other protocols, the ones that are existing out there, would have different uh, level of comfort to regulators in terms of, hey, can we build an at-scale uh, deployment on these decentralized systems? And what are the risks to... Uh, their industry uh, if there is a fault in the system, right? Uh, 
right? And things like 51% of tax, for instance. Um, that Those are massive risks. Therefore, in terms of an evolutionary step, uh, I can see that, you know, permission blockchains um, become an easy entry point for such centralized entities to engage with a blockchain, understand it, experience it, learn from it. And over time, as that understanding and knowledge grows, uh, I can see the next evolutionary step, which is moving to more decentralized uh, systems, right? Um, and that, that would be something that I think is, is, is highly likely. Uh, the second part of the question concerns Atala. Uh, you know, Atala is, a, is an IHK uh, initiative, and I think it's best that uh, somebody, uh, that IHK answers uh, that question. I am not qualified to uh, give an answer to that. Thank you, man, mate. Thank you. Yeah, Those were great enough. responses. Great responses. Yes, I right. want to thank all the Reddit users for their wonderful questions. Rick, did you have anything, any last questions to ask Man Meat? No, also thanks to the Reddit users, but I do have one last question. So, if you, what, what would you prefer, Porsche or Lambo? Are you a Porsche guy, Lambo guy? <laughs> Uh, man, I, I, I take uh, I take Grab here in Singapore. Uh, I don't own a car here. Uh, Grab is the sort of local ride sharing app. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Fair oh, enough. God. Fair okay. enough. Take the cab. All right. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Thank you, Man Meat, for being on the podcast. Thank I you. very much appreciate it. I learned a lot from you, and you're welcome to come back anytime. We loved having you on here. Thank you, yes, sir. yes. So thank you to all the viewers and listeners for the Cardano Effect podcast. We had Manmeet Singh. He is a legend in the Cardano community. I mean, this was a great podcast, and we finally have you on. We hear a lot about your name, and you know, I know you're doing a lot of work behind the scenes, but the community is going to have a good chance to see and hear what you're doing. And uh, like Rick said, we'd love to have you on again. And uh, anyone who's still watching, I'm glad that you made it this far. Please remember to subscribe, like, comment, share this podcast. We can get wonderful guests like this if you continue boosting up the stats for our podcast. And we appreciate you, man, meet. You have a wonderful day in Singapore. And until the next episode of the Cardano Effect podcast, bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.